Kwon Su immediately locked his hands and kicked, saying something that startled So Yun, making him ask, What? He didn't know how to respond. Meanwhile, the intense battle between Haru and Yu Jion continued. Haru launched an attack, but Kia countered with a wrestling move that threw him off. Yu Jion was caught off guard when So Yun intervened, using his Kion hand to push him back. Though it was intense, So Yun had urgent matters to attend to, so he had to step back. Haru still wanted to fight on his own, but So Yun urged him to quickly take down Yu Jion and retreat, as Nam Kang Buk High School was on its way. Through Jiang Jihyuk's message, they learned that the place where they were fighting was a warehouse owned by Nam Kang Buk High School. Kang Sok, aware of the situation, had mobilized forces, including some tough guys, to the scene. With only the two of them, they couldn't handle the entire force of Nam Kang Buk High School, so they had to take down Yu Jiam and leave. So, Haru switched from solo play to judo with So Yen and attacked. They fought together, one punching while the other dodged. However, only Haru managed to successfully land hits, while So Yun was dodging and getting hit, ending up back where he started. Time was running out, so he gritted his teeth and activated all his best cards. This included enduring pain for two minutes, gaining 100 pounds in five seconds, and switching attributes with Heijun. But with the attributes switched, So Yun felt something was off, as his stats now showed a vibrant red, indicating his heightened state. The junior, who had been acting like a timid rabbit all this time, now had no choice but to rely entirely on Yu Giam. Suddenly, Yu Giam's eyes shifted as if he had some plan in mind. At this moment, Yu Giam was overwhelmed by the combined momentum of the two hack game guys, leaving him extremely exhausted. Both So Yun and Haru joined forces, ready to strike together, and So Yun shouted, Come on, what's with Nam Kang Buk High School? Thinking it was the end, So Yun was about to crow triumphantly when suddenly everything went dark. The sudden blackout made the two stop in their tracks, startled as they looked around in the darkness. It turned out that it was the junior from Nam Kang Buk who cleverly turned off the lights and then flashed a light, calling for his senior Yu Jian to come to his aid. Haru was furious and wanted to kick the scheming junior, but So Yun stopped him, wanting to find the switch instead. Haru felt helpless as So Yun groped around, complaining about the scorching sun. They found the switch, but it didn't work. It seemed the junior had done something to it. Suddenly, the lights came back on, and to their surprise, the shadow was gone. It turned out that Kaya had saved Yu Jian when the power went out. So Yun realized they had fallen into a power outage trap, likely set by the opposing team. Even Kwon Su Kaya had been rescued. Saving two people at once made So Yun suspect that this group had specialized training in deception. But if they were alone in taking the two away, it would be slow going. Indeed, it was difficult for the junior to support both at the same time. If they chased after them, they might catch them, but Nam Kang Buk's reinforcements would arrive soon. So Yun decided to step back, but he wasn't discouraged because victory was theirs. The most reputable Earth server had announced that the mission to defeat Yu Jiam had been completed, along with the mission to rescue the girl. So Yun received two back Kim cards at once, one basic camera card and a lucky red envelope card. He didn't know what their uses were yet. Outside, Xion Ha had regained consciousness. He expressed heartfelt gratitude to the two for saving So Yun. Therefore, he paid attention to the fact that Bak Kang Buk's school owed a favor to Tae Kang Buk's school, although the other side was unaware of it, leaving with a reminder from the teacher Forget about enemies, but never forget favors. It turned out that Haru was the one who called Chion Ha. Although he was unfamiliar with the latter, Chion Ha knew him, which was quite surprising for Haru. Feeling tired after a long day without achieving much, Haru sighed in frustration. 
So Yun teased him about it, and Haoru jokingly asked how he could help. They noticed some members of the Nam Kang Buck leadership team, all with bruised faces, but still standing confidently before So Yun. Haru couldn't understand why So Yun brought them along. So Yun explained that they brought these individuals along because they were once Pentane transfer students, so they might have useful information or skills to offer. He also hinted at another purpose for their presence. Addressing the group, So Yun made it clear, you all witnessed it yourselves. The two of us already took down Yu Jiam and Jum Boom Sang. Now, let me speak frankly. We've only utilized the strength to defeat them, and we haven't even tapped into the full power of Tay School. If the Potato Squad were to join in, you'd be finished. Don't underestimate us. He also warned them about the precarious situation Nam Kan Buck School was facing, despite Jum Boom Sang and Yu Jiam returning to Kang Sok. He emphasized that even a lone swallow couldn't make spring especially when Don Kang Buk and Tae Kang Buk have formed an alliance. After some discourse, So Yun suggested that these individuals join their forces, promising to take care of them and even enhance their bragging rights. So Yun also used the teaching card to enhance his ability to persuade the enemies, and the skill was successful. The Kia group was shaken, with five mouths saying they would remain loyal. This meant that 15 members of the commanding team had now become part of the Taekang Buck High School force. The next morning at school, while the teacher was enthusiastically teaching, So Yun rested his chin, avoiding listening to yesterday's events that had left him apprehensive. He feared that Nam Kang Buck might target his family again, making the upcoming battle even more difficult. Nonetheless, he felt fortunate that Ho Ru had awakened, giving them an advantage against Yu Gion. Although the battle was far from over, Taekang Buck High School had significantly strengthened its position. Lost in thought, So Yun was interrupted by Cherin asking to borrow an eraser. He turned to her and gestured for her to take it. Cherin, feeling embarrassed, thanked him and glanced back at So Yun. So Yun recalled the events of yesterday, but couldn't find the right moment to bring it up. Oh, I'm itching because of a bug bite, he said, taking the opportunity to mention it again. Let me make a cross for you. Then he asked, did you get bitten there, or is it still bothering you? Suddenly, Cherin shuffled her feet, feeling embarrassed, and said it was underneath her foot. Upon hearing this, So Yun quickly turned down the volume, saying, even if we're friends or more, this is a bit too much. Cherin seemed disappointed in him, feeling embarrassed and humiliated, but she let it go. I'm such an idiot, So Yun thought to himself. Finally, So Yun stated that he didn't pay attention to that matter, but reminded Cherin that they were still in class. How can we play Thaptuja during class? he asked. He then promised to do it during break time. Surprisingly, Cherin extended her foot again, indicating that she wanted him to do it now, without hesitation or embarrassment. While the teacher continued his enthusiastic lecture at the front of the class, unaware of the antics happening below, So Yun wasted no time and discreetly extended his hand. Cherin's face grew redder by the moment, a sign of her embarrassment, yet she remained cheeky enough to resort to such antics to ease her discomfort. She turned away, pretending to focus on copying notes, while still keeping her foot resting on So Yun's thigh, teasingly pressing down. Finally, Thaptuja had completed. Surprisingly, the teacher singled out the two of them during class. What were they up to? Several students also looked with judgmental eyes. Look at Cherin and So Yun, as adulterous women, captured in battle then quickly pretended to study. The teacher kept asking what you two were doing just now both So Yun and Cherin were embarrassed. If we fight a fire, we don't do anything. At Nam Kang Buck school, Bom Sang had returned, bowing his head in apology for losing to Kim So Yun. Consequently, he accepted the punishment. Kang Sok's face remained as dark as ever, visibly seething with anger. However, 
he surprisingly adopted a friendly tone, stating that Bum Sang had been punished enough and questioning if he had ever been reprimanded before. Bum Sang thought he had escaped, only to receive a sudden and unexpected slap from Kang Sok, marking the first time Kang Sok had struck him. Kang Sok interrogated Bum Sang about his actions, questioning why he had failed to make any noise despite capturing So Lian. Kang Sok expressed his frustration at losing despite having the team leaders and Yu Jiam under his command, as well as losing the leadership position. Even the Famax Nil group had dissipated. Bum Sang sat silently, accepting the defeat and apologizing with a bowed head. At this moment, everyone listened attentively to Kang Sok's words, realizing that the current situation was far from ideal. Kim so Hyun has successfully outmaneuvered Bum Sang, seizing control of the West, while Han Jae Ha is pushing towards the East, attacking Nam Kang Buk's main headquarters. With these two forces advancing, Bum Sang proposes an idea to Kang Sok, urging him to trust in him. Kang Sok, in agreement, solemnly declares to everyone that they have no retreat. If they lose this battle as well, it will mark the end for Nam Kang Buk. Therefore, this will be the final showdown. Meanwhile, at So Yun's house, he sits pondering the unusual behavior of the clouds today. They seem to be in a childish mood, feeling annoyed for being exploited by So Yun. Wanting to go outside, the cloud reluctantly agreed to gather, but was punished before any results could be seen, feeling that its owner has underestimated it and betrayed it to the enemy. Solian feels helpless dealing with the stubborn cloud. Watching countless movies over 180 minutes long made him think all over the place. Reflecting on it, he realizes that feeling deceived is quite uncomfortable. The cloud, which usually waits only for him, made him decide to indulge it this time to make up for it. So he decides to go along with whatever it wants. After a bit of coaxing, he finally opens his mouth and the cloud tosses the phone to him. Upon checking, he sees a promotional video for the Seoul World Culture Festival 2022. It turns out the cloud wants to go there. So caught up in the festive atmosphere, so Yun decides to accompany the cloud to the festival. As they enjoy the lively event, So Yun notices the cloud seems happier. It's so pleased that its neck is practically wobbling off. Seeing it cheered up, So Yun also feels relieved from life's worries. Coincidentally, So is also present at the festival, and she is surprised to see So Yun there. So Yun hesitantly asks why So is also here. So replies that she came with some friends from school, but got separated from them. Her friends are also curious about where she went. One of them responds that So said she had something to do and went off alone. Another friend agrees, noting that So isn't the type to get lost easily. But now, seeing So claiming to be lost and coincidentally encountering So Yun, it's clear that it's not an accident but intentional. Soa then curiously looks around to see if Da Hyun is also with So Yun. So Yun, feeling awkward, makes the cloud disappear. Soa is surprised because she saw the two together, but now they're nowhere to be found. So Yun can only silently apologize to the cloud, promising to summon it back soon. For now, he needs to deal with Soa. Soa, still appearing weak, asks So Yun if he could help her find her friends. So Yun reassures her and offers to search together. But then he suddenly stiffens and asks So Ha if holding hands like this feels too pressured, as if he's forcing her. So Ha expresses fear, worrying about getting lost again. So Yun scratches his head, feeling it's a valid concern because there are many people around. Suddenly, the system announces that the cloud has been summoned confusing So Yun, but the cloud has already run off somewhere on its own, leaving So Yun feeling worried. The cloud stops somewhere, surrounded by cheers and excitement. It's a performance stage with many people below, cheering for Princess Bin Duong Elisa. Currently idol parfait, Elisa is performing, and So Yun experiences this whirlwind dance for the first time, standing still in awe. 
At the same time, So Yun found herself with a heart-shaped drawing on her cheek by So Ha, which carried a significant meaning. So Ha warned her not to touch it, and So Yun could only nod in response. Recent events have made So Yun feel a bit off. Despite being known for searching for friends, the two of them had gone from doodling to fortune-telling. They even had their compatibility assessed astrologically. Afterwards, they went out for ice cream. So acted more naturally than a significant other, even sharing a spoon with So Yun. Perhaps the scent still lingered on the spoon. Being with So Ha like this made So Yun feel unable to stay clear-headed. As they sat together, So Ha expressed a surprise at being able to attend the festival with So Yun. So Yun, feeling somewhat dazed, could only smile in response. He felt it wasn't the right time for this and that he needed to quickly summon the clouds back. He didn't want to cause any trouble with them. So, he made an excuse to go to the bathroom to summon them back. Suddenly, amidst the bustling crowd, So Yun was startled. Looking around, he saw everyone staring as if they had seen someone incredibly beautiful approaching him. That person was heading towards So Yun, leaving him bewildered. So Yun could only inquire, but the newcomer confirmed that indeed he was no longer just someone from around. Now So Yun could go out and have fun with them. So Yun, suspicious, asked again, who is that? At that moment, the idol parfait Elisa, who seemed frustrated with her idol duties, was outside her car, followed by the clouds. They stood there as if they had a plan. As a result, they transformed into the likeness of Elisa, now looking stunningly beautiful. So's hand tightened around So Yun even more, and she cautiously questioned the other person, wondering if they were trying to steal her boyfriend. The clouds bluntly stated that she didn't need to know who they were, as this selfish person was their master. Hearing this, the onlookers gasped in shock, quickly covering their mouths. Even So couldn't hide her astonishment. Meanwhile, the clouds remained standing there, closer to So Yun than before. Startled, So Yun turned around when she overheard the murmurs about Elisa's owner and the implications of servitude, feeling the situation spiraling out of control. So Yun quickly grabbed the hands of the two people and pulled them away, intending to deal with them later. After breaking free from So Yun's grip, the quick-witted person explained that they were distant relatives, pointing at the fake clouds claiming they were from Hawaii and named Cloud. As for the other person, named Ting Han, they didn't know much. In general, they hailed from Korea. So had also glimpsed Elisa, which made her suspicious, and she questioned, why not ask her? So Yun promptly replied, that's just someone who looks like her. After all, hybrids can all look alike. Then, she pulled out her phone as evidence and showed a live broadcast of Eliza alone in the car, proving that she was indeed alone, making the people genuinely friendly. So Ha quickly believed and apologized for the rude assumption. So Yun assured her it was fine, as it was all just a ruse anyway. Then So Ha took further action, questioning the clouds in English, asking when they had been to Korea. So Yun was surprised by this bold move, feeling a headache coming on. After all, the clouds had only been reading comic books and at most knew how to say hello in English. So her persisted, asking why they didn't speak English if they were from America. Feeling the tension rise, Sodian decided to intervene. So her, it's not like that, she said. Luckily, our friends found us. Your mom called, so you have to go. Then she turned to Sova and gestured for her to leave first. So Yun waved goodbye to Sova, emphasizing that she and the clouds were just friends, without specifying anything further about the other person. Soha, curious, asked why So Yun's face looked flushed. So Yun, feeling embarrassed, explained that she had never heard of the person named An before. So Yun's friend from many years, Da Yun, introduced them and she was eager to know more about their relationship. Suddenly, Sova's friend inquired about the spoon she was holding, wondering what it was for. Soa held onto the spoon tightly, 
refusing to give it to anyone else because it was the spoon so Yun had used. Sova even licked the spoon to taste so Yun's lingering flavor, revealing her mischievous nature. Later, so Yun, feeling a bit tired, sat down and asked the clouds what their plans were. They seemed remorseful and admitted they just wanted to live a normal life, but ended up causing a big fuss. So Yun reassured them, understanding their desire to appear in the world. Suddenly, the clouds asked why So Lun's face was so red. So Yun quickly made up an excuse, claiming it was because she had seen a girl up close for the first time, causing her to blush. Then the clouds asked if So Yun liked them. So Yun responded positively, jokingly mentioning their Heijun form. However, she felt their conversation was getting too intense. Suddenly, one of the clouds grabbed So Yun's hand and pressed her face against their fruit, sincerely thanking her. So Yun, surprised, asked what it was for. The cloud explained that So Yun was the reason they still existed in this world, promising to repay her kindness by giving her fruit every day. So Yun couldn't help but smile and ask what they were thanking her for. The cloud simply replied, for everything. The next morning at school, in the club room, the group of students stood neatly in formation, listening to the president's speech. So Young was standing there too. The group below immediately suggested changing the meeting location. They were tired of always meeting there. So Young found it reasonable and asked where they should meet instead. Suddenly, the junior member rushed in, shouting that something big had happened. This startled everyone. So Young quickly calmed him down and asked what was going on. The junior then frantically gestured and spoke incoherently. So Yun breathed a sigh of relief because it was chilly and someone brought a blanket. Then she asked another junior to convey the message. I already know, she said. Right now, at Nam Kang Buk School, Kang Sok is sitting comfortably, legs crossed. Bum San noticed that we have enough people, so he asked for permission to speak. Looking at the map, you can see it. Our situation is quite desperate. We only have a few large areas left. Everyone's morale is at an all-time low. At this moment, the eastern and western areas are just sitting there. They won't hesitate to attack us. Unlike previous small battles, we are now facing the eastern alliance head-on. Western, everyone remembered this. If we lose this time, the power of Nam Kang Buk's school will completely disappear. Hang Sok stood up and praised the guy, saying he was quite competent. Then he asked if there was any battle plan yet. Bum Sign admitted that he lacked intelligence, so all his battle plans were ineffective. He looked frustrated and said this would be his last battle. Suddenly, a junior shouted that something big had happened. Dong Kang Buk had made a move. These were Kang Sok's cherry tree brothers. Kang Sok calmly lit a cigarette, took a drag, and regained his composure. The top four of Don Kang Buk, Siu Dong Tak, had swiftly dealt with the situation. Then he turned and asked for confirmation. A hand rested on his shoulder, saying to leave it be. Tak was overly concerned about health, so he wanted to confirm safety. They were cautious in every step they took. The guy by his side, with red-tinted hair, Thaitin, was Ryusa queuing. The third ranked. Han Jae had teased the red-haired guy, revealing everything, so people joked that Don Kang Buk was full of idiots. Then someone said they would guide him. Han Jae immediately criticized, saying that the biggest issue was Yeon Chang Gong, the second ranked. He had a scar near his eye that he didn't like. They had also contacted Sodian, and the whole team was ready to act. Then, the entire Don Kang Buk school, under Han Jae-ha's leadership, began to move. At the same time, the thick broad guy began to listen to the analysis. If Nam Kang Buk school deployed its forces thinly, then Tae Kang Buk would regroup and concentrate their strength in one place. If Nam Kang Buk had many talented individuals and troops, then Dong Kang Buk's strength mainly lay in its elite members. Among the top four, there were the strongest individuals. 
Those on their side trusted and revered Han Jaeha, much like crazy idol fans. So Yun had been nodding in agreement all this while. On their side, there were also many skilled individuals, namely Hei Jun and Haru, the deadly duo with top-notch combat skills. At this point, the main task was to exploit the weakening of Nam Kang Buk's school. Kim So Hyun will have to defeat 50 members of Nam Kang Buk's school in combat. The following missions are still pending, and the rewards are unclear. Therefore, So Hyun called everyone to set off. The mission had been issued, so today would be the last day for Nam Kang Buk's school. Suddenly, Jang Ji Hyuk ran out with uncertain expression on his face, cautioning everyone not to attack Nam Kang Buk's school first. So Ian didn't understand why he was flip-flopping like Nobita's bamboo copter. Didn't they agree with Han Jaeha? Jang Ji Hyuk replied with uncertainty that it was because of Han Jaeha. Kwon Su exclaimed in fear that once they attacked Nam Kang Buk, Han Jaeha would retaliate immediately. Everyone was puzzled why Han Jaeha would attack them, as they were supposed to be allies. Kwon Su waved his fan to add credibility and then asserted that this time Nam Kang Buk would be completely wiped out even more than a crush. He then outlined what would happen next, explaining that the alliance of the East and West sides would seize control after the destruction of Nam Kang Buk. Kwon Su affirmed that if they destroyed Nam Kang Buk, the East side would attack them because they were not entirely allies. Therefore, Han Jaeha instructed them to attack first to deplete their strength in battle with Nam Kang Buk, and the east side would take advantage of that and attack when they were weak. Han Jaeha was the type of person who could do that. After understanding this, So Yun realized something else and quickly applauded Kwon Su, who blushed with embarrassment. Kwon Su then soberly stated that they needed to find a reason not to attack Nam Kang Buk first. If they outright refused, their relationship with the east side would deteriorate. So Yun suddenly became enlightened and confidently stated that she had a brilliant idea. Now was the time for the mission to begin. Meanwhile, Han Jaeha was leisurely smoking his Thang Long cigarette when he suddenly snapped out of his reverie and asked what was going on. So Yun's teammate, fearing Han Jaeha's wrath, hesitantly explained. So Yun, on the other hand, used the excuse that it would be very challenging to attack first because the forces of Nam District were still present. If they attacked Kangsok, they might be ambushed from behind. Therefore, So Yun proposed to clean up the surrounding forces before launching the attack. Meanwhile, the east side would attack Kangsok first. After conveying her message, So Yun quickly set off, and her teammates had to commend her foresight. They knew in advance that these guys would quietly play tricks and see if Kwon Su would come out good. Han Jae had lit another cigarette and mentioned someone named Kang Ji Hyuk, the same Jang Ji Hyuk who had disrupted all their plans, prompting the top four to ask how they were supposed to attack Nam District now, just as Kim So Yun had suggested. Han Jae had nodded approvingly, indicating that they didn't need to waste their strength unnecessarily. The east side would also clear the area first. At this moment, Bum San looked out and saw the opponents, realizing that they weren't a perfect alliance. They would assume that Nam District would surely be wiped out, so they were wary of each other. Bum San, with his sharp mind, targeted this weakness and launched sneak attacks on those who let their guard down, playing dirty if necessary and eliminating them one by one. Meanwhile, the members of Nam Kang Buk were struggling because their opponents were the formidable Shandong squad. It seemed like every time they picked up their weapons, they were on a rampage, shouting for their parents as they brought down their foes. However, Yundong was not satisfied yet. He wanted to catch up to the seniors and needed to make significant leaps forward. Moreover, the Nam Kang Buk members were risking their lives to defend their territory, charging forward despite the overwhelming odds. But behind Hyundong was a commando team as disciplined as an army. Hyundong led them to engage with Nam Kang Buk under his orders 
a blatant betrayal from former allies turned enemies. Afterward, Hyundong reported the situation over the phone, claiming they had detected Naun District and were dealing with them. Similarly, under Sovin's command, bodies lay scattered at her feet. When Hyundong asked about Dong Kan Buk, it left Sodian feeling frustrated because they were also following their own trend, prolonging the time and not attacking the main base of Nam district. Hyundong's expression turned serious as he asked if it could all end today. Suddenly, Sodian couldn't hear Hyundong's voice anymore, which startled him, prompting him to ask if something had gone wrong. It turned out Hyundong's phone had fallen leaving so Bian in disbelief as he witnessed Kang Sok's unexpected appearance. Kang Sok's demeanor was grim. He was not a harbinger of fortune, but rather a harbinger of death. It seemed that not long ago, according to the plan to attack Jum Bum San, it was deduced that Don Kang Buk and Tae Kang Buk were mobilizing forces to clear the area. Since both sides were engaged in mental warfare, they wouldn't pay attention to Nam District. Therefore, the elders of Nam District would ambush the eastern and western districts. If successful, it would diminish their forces and turn the tide of battle back to the Stone Age. Especially in this battle, Kang Sok had to show his face. Bum San was the king, and a new move was needed to intimidate them. Thus, Kang Sok appeared on behalf of Nam Kang Buk. Hyundong was now desperate, swinging his stick wildly like Ngo Kong. But he was frozen in shock when Kang Sok caused no harm. Before he could comprehend, Kang Sok charged forward and struck Kang Dong's abdomen, mocking him for being disconnected from the server with just a slight obstruction. Kang Sok then grabbed Hyun Dong tightly, his veins pulging as he delivered the decisive blow, ending Kang Dong's resistance. The commando team portrayed Nan Kang Buk leaving them paralyzed with fear as Kang Sok didn't forget their treachery. They greeted Nam Kang Bok with friendly smiles, even enthusiastically removing their shirts. It was a bitter lesson for those who acted rashly. Meanwhile, as Han Jae-ho was fiercely fighting, the top four member asked him who would win if he fought Kang Sok. Han Jae-ho immediately criticized the four-eyed nerd's intellectual development. In battle, one must use their brain. Why focus on fighting? The top four only wanted to know his strength. Han Jae-ha likened Kang Sok to a rhinoceros, a nickname that Kang Sok had earned for being a wrestling rhino. The commando team now understood better. Everyone was scared of being hit, causing chaos and panic. If the rhino didn't want to be hit, he should run away before things got worse. The news of Kang Sok appearing in Hyundong's area had spread, but so Yun's response was calm. He said they were not negligent, but rather prepared for ambushes. Surprisingly, he had already arranged forces, Sun Haru and Kwon Su in one team, Ku Te and so Yun in another, while Li Hyundong and Go Weijin joined the commando team. So Yun then used a camera card to assess the members' abilities allowing him to evaluate their skills through a hologram window. He used it for Hajin. At this moment, tension filled the air. Hajin immediately wanted to greet Kang Sok, who responded with a sly smile. So Yun had planned that once Kang Sok appeared, Hajin would also step forward. The two of them faced off, trying to outstare each other. Of course, in this game, Kang Sok seemed unbeatable. They looked disdainfully at each other, then began to exchange blows, each landing a punch on the other's face. So Yun, on the sidelines, watched through the monitoring system, cheering on Hei Jun, urging him to go and kill that dog Kia for me. The confrontation between the two sides was intense. Hei Jun exerted himself, throwing powerful punches, but Kang Sok blocked them all with his arms, like a steel shield. Despite Heijun's relentless attacks, Kang Sok remained unfazed, maintaining his handsome appearance that women adored. Deciding to step back, Heijun then launched a punch straight into Kang Sok's ribs, targeting a vulnerable spot that made Kang Sok grimace in pain. Heijun followed up with a barrage of punches, 
each one landing squarely on Kang Sok's ribs with a resounding impact that echoed through the surroundings. Kang Sok grimaced in pain, intending to take a breath, but before he could, Heijun delivered a powerful punch to his face, causing it to swell and bruise. The onlookers cheered as Heijun's relentless punches proved that, no matter how tough Kang Sok seemed, he was no match for Heijun's seasoned fists. On So Yan's side, it was no different. He believed that Kang Sok was weakening. Following this, Heijun danced like a man possessed, continuously using his fists. But Kang Sok seemed as resilient as a sandbag, enduring the blows without flinching. In this situation, Heijun only needed to land one more punch to win. He didn't want to prolong the fight, so he charged forward like a missile. Suddenly, he was startled when Kang Sok's shirt was thrown up. At this moment, Han Jae-ha was explaining to the top four why Kang Sok was called the Rhinoceros. It was simple. No matter how many times the opponent attacked, as long as Kang Sok retaliated once, it was game over. Heijun's face contorted as Kang Sok delivered a direct blow to his stomach. So Yun's expression darkened as she saw Heijun being caught. Their group cheered loudly, secretly cursing Kang Sok. One of them pointed to the scene where Heijun had Kang Sok restrained. They continued to cheer, declaring Heijun as the unrivaled champion. Both Heijun and Kang Sok were locked in a struggle, their faces flushed with exertion. One was on the brink of victory, the other on the verge of defeat. So Yun predicted that Kang Sok was also exhausted from taking too many hits, but if Heijun managed to break free and land one more punch, he would emerge as the victor. Heijun struggled to break free, but Kang Sok clung to him like a leech. At this point, Han Jaeha explained why Kang Sok was called the Rhinoceros. It was because, although he had strong physical strength, his personality was also very rigid. Rhinoceroses are herbivores but have dirty personalities. Both So Yun and our group were frozen in shock as Kang Sok managed to push back against Heijun, causing Heijun to curve silently. His grip tightened even more, and then he executed a wrestling move, driving Heijun into the ground like a nail. Heijun slipped away, but he could still hold on, except he made a mistake. Kang Sok then lifted him from behind, and by the time Heijun realized this, it was too late. He struggled once again, leaving Algrud in a state of panic. How could someone like him, who seemed so useless, help Black Infinity? So Yun was frozen stiff because Heijun had already accepted defeat. Then Kang Sok called Bomsang to announce that Heijun had been caught. Bomsang gloated because the Taekang Buck school had lost a major player. He also inquired about Kang Sok's condition as Kang Sok had taken quite a beating. Bum San understood and immediately sent someone to pick up Kang Sok. He also mentioned that Yu Gion had already contacted them. Yu Gion was currently single-handedly eliminating Don Kan Buck's action team A. Han Jai -ha also arrived at the scene, seeing his comrade lying here. He demanded an explanation, and we honestly answered that Yu Gion had launched a surprise attack on action team A rendering them unable to fight back. Along with this, news of Heijun's capture had also arrived. A younger member bowed his head and said that Nam Kang Buk High School was targeting us. The second-ranked student spoke up, confirming that they were being targeted, and on top of that, Taekang Buk High School had lost Heijun as well. Just as they were about to come out, someone called out to Han Jaeha, pointing in the other direction. So Yun looked stern, leaving us puzzled as to what was going on. Wasn't their relationship usually bad? Or was he not afraid at all? But overall, he seemed as cool as a toilet. The red-haired guy secretly praised So Yun, saying he was quite interesting. What's the purpose of coming here alone? So Yun and Han Jai -ha faced each other not speaking, but their expressions said it all tension was palpable. Later, Kwon Su Ji Hyuk hurriedly called So Yun on the phone. So Yun had just finished 
talking with Han Jaeha. They reached an agreement that even if they caught Nam Kang Buk, they would maintain their alliance. Both sides had confirmed what they wanted, so even if Nam Kang Buk was captured, Dom Kang Buk would not retaliate. Next, they would do something about Nam Kang Buk. At this point, the bearheads cheered happily upon hearing that Hei Jun had been caught. While they were chatting happily, one of them noticed something strange and turned around, only to receive a punch from So Yun. He appeared out of nowhere, descending from above. Quan Su was on the phone, also taken aback. Now the main task has entered phase two. Tae Kang Buk and Dong Kang Buk are dealing with the top 20 people from Nam Kang Buk. So Yun at this point is not only focused on the mission, but also wants to retaliate against them. Heru's condition is still excellent, and Koite is ready for the task, awakening the hidden power beyond a level. The reward is two high-level strength enhancement cards, two defense cards, and two randomly advanced attack cards. Inside Koite, there's a feeling that something is rising, not just the power of Koite returning to Nam Kang Buk. Meanwhile, Kang Sok is applying a pain relief patch. He was truly beaten all over by Heijun, remembering how Heijun's continuous onslaught made him numb with pain. Thom Sun asked if he's in bad shape, to which Kang Sok replied affirmatively and expressed a desire to rest for a bit. Kang Sok then worriedly asked Bum Sang what to do next, but Bum Sang remained calm, stating that they just need to instigate Dong Kang Buk and Tae Kang Buk to fight each other. However, exploiting the fragile relationship between the two sides is not easy and could worsen it, causing them to withdraw from Nam Kang Buk and accumulate strength again. Amidst the commotion, a member rushed in, announcing that there's a big event happening. So Yun found Han Jaiha and negotiated a partnership. Now, Dong Kang Buk and Tae Kang Buk have joined forces and begun attacking Nam Kang Buk. With both sides officially declaring war, there's nothing stopping them. Bum Sang cursed under his breath upon hearing this. Unexpectedly, So Yun managed to convince Han Jaiha, who even wanted to prepare for a new battle. However, Kang Sok intervened stating that once he recovered, he would capture So Yun. Meanwhile, the top ten of Nam Kang Buk urged their comrades to rally. They aimed to boost morale by capturing Hei Jun, who was caught by Kang Sok. They wanted to stand with Dong Kang Buk and Tae Kang Buk to show the true strength of Nam Kang Buk. Everyone cheered for Nam Kang Buk's victory, but suddenly the top ranked student from Dong Kang Buk emerged shouting encouragement. This unexpected appearance left everyone puzzled. Politely acknowledging him, they were surprised by his presence. Just as he arrived, a red-haired individual greeted him, knocking him out with a punch. Indeed, their strength was formidable. Meanwhile, in So Yun's vicinity, the top 16 student from Nam Kang Buk had also been defeated. So Yun and Hao Ru appeared, wreaking havoc in the area. The junior member ran over, declaring it as a sign of victory. Han Jaeha and his skilled companions were moving towards them. From the fifth-ranked student onwards, Nam Kan Buk had been completely wiped out. Despite their small numbers, the newcomers were exceptionally powerful, sweeping through like a storm. So Yun was thrilled to see Han Jaeha arrive, knowing that they only needed to capture the top nine students now. A junior member loudly proclaimed Li Ji Yun as the ninth ranked student, who was currently leading a group from Nam Kang Buk and facing off against someone from Dong Kang Buk. The situation was tense and could escalate at any moment, with Li Ji Yun's side at a disadvantage and likely to be captured by Dong Kang Buk. So Yun then glanced towards Ko Te, who had been listening intently from his seat. With a serious expression, Kote called out to So Yun, expressing his desire to rescue her. Despite knowing it was not advisable, Kote was determined to receive something important from her. Therefore, he earnestly pleaded with So Yun to allow him to go and rescue her. Just as he stood up, Kwon Su rushed out to intervene, 
his bulky frame already aware of everything that had transpired. He quickly stopped Koite, realizing that his actions could be perceived as declaring war against Don Kan Buck. With their current good relations, Koite's departure would only worsen the situation, making it impossible to defeat Nam Kan Buck today. Kwon Su, speaking from his own experiences, understood Koite's feelings advising him not to act impulsively, even if he was madly in love. Disheartened, Kote relented. However, Soyeon reassured them that she had a plan. Just as Bumsan finally had time to administer some medicine, another junior member rushed in with urgent news. Lee Ji Hyun requested reinforcements, but Bumsang chose to ignore the plea, not wanting to waste any more resources. At that moment, Ji Hyun, the tough girl faced her opponents head-on. She unleashed a lightning-fast skill, cutting through a group of injured fighters. Exhausted, she waited for assistance, unaware that reinforcements might not arrive. Some students from Dong Kan Buk, impressed by her fighting prowess, praised her before deciding to launch their own attacks. The 13th-ranked student stepped forward with a powerful kick aimed at Ji Hyun. Unable to dodge, Ji Hyun's hesitation brought amusement to her opponent. Looks like you're running out of steam, he taunted, seizing the opportunity to capture her as she prepared to deliver a finishing blow. However, before he could act, someone snatched Ji Hyun away in a paper bag, stealing his chance. Confused by the sudden turn of events, he stood there dumbfounded. Meanwhile, upon hearing So Yun's intention to intervene, Kwon Su angrily rebuked her. Their alliance with Dong Kan Buk would be jeopardized if they acted rashly. If things went wrong, even Ko Te could be in danger. However, So Yun had another plan in mind, determined not to break the alliance. At this very moment, Ji Hyun looked up at the person wearing the Kia hat, who remarked, What are you looking at? Indeed, you're an ugly cat. From afar, the person carrying the paper bag, none other than Kowite, drew the attention of the Kia students, who insulted him, questioning the purpose of the paper bag on his head. Kowite took the opportunity to introduce himself, asserting, I am Kim Tuije, the Taekwondo master, even more impressive than Kowite. Where did you even learn? Amidst the commotion, So Yun was focused on the awakening process, recalling that even Haru didn't know about it. She remembered how their powers suddenly increased, a sentiment echoed by Kyun Dong. Nothing seemed to affect them, not even their superhuman IQ. Ki Hyun, curious about the newcomer, wondered why he had saved her. Ko Te, still in the paper bag, replied that he had to obtain something from her. Meanwhile, So Yun was engrossed in monitoring the awakening process, reminiscing about her conversation with Haru, where they both couldn't explain the sudden increase in power. This phenomenon was also noticed by Qian Dong, who felt the same way. Nothing seemed to affect them, despite their exceptional intelligence. So Yun had grasped the gist of the awakening conditions and returned to where Ko Te was. There, Ko Te confessed his feelings, revealing that he had lost his heart to her. Meanwhile, Chu Hakchin, with his stylish hair, had been waiting, seemingly uninterested, until he was pestered. Then someone arrived, followed by a group. Seeing them, he stood up, claiming there was something crucial that would change their future. This statement puzzled the Kia students, prompting them to inquire how it could alter their future. He affirmed that it would, then discussed something with them, suggesting betrayal against Nam Kan Buk. The Kia students were aware of this. Now, Nam Kan Buk had no hope left. Both Don Kan Buk and Te Kan Buk had begun to bring in high-ranking individuals. Sooner or later, they would all be captured. Nevertheless, the Kia students viewed them merely as inconsequential kids, innocent in their eyes. Hak Jin, known for his dirty tactics, attempted to convince everyone to capture Kang Sok to end the conflict. He boasted about this being an act of goodwill, only to receive a punch from Salman, causing him to fall. Salman then proceeded to curse him, 
mocking his sense of humor and questioning how he could come up with such a joke. Some man expressed gratitude toward Kang Sok, acknowledging that everything they had achieved was due to the influence of Nam Kang Buk. He couldn't understand why someone would want to betray them instead of showing appreciation. Sung Man then took back all of Hakchen's forces as a consequence of his betrayal. As for the Kia student, he decided to let them go and align themselves with Tae Kang Buk. Sung Man immediately left, leaving behind the defeated Kia student. Meanwhile, Ji Hyun found herself momentarily stunned upon hearing the accusation that she had lost her heart to someone, triggering a memory of a past encounter under the streetlights. She stood up affirming that the person in question was indeed the one before her, the wild cat whose name she didn't know. It seemed absurd, but now she questioned why this person had come here. She initially thought they had come to mock her, as they were clearly enemies. Contrary to her expectations, Kuwate urged her to stay calm and remain silent. The Dong Kang Buk faction was visibly frustrated, having nearly caught Ji Yun only for her to slip away once again. They cursed the mysterious newcomer, but Koite remained indifferent, focusing solely on wooing Ji Hyun. He advised her not to regard him with the eyes of an enemy, hoping she would sense his sincerity. To him, actions spoke louder than words. Koite's confident demeanor impressed even the Kia and Dong Kang Buk factions, who had heard of his moniker Kim Tui Jie, and his capability to rival Qian Ha. Feeling his aura as a Taekwondo master, they also had to be cautious. Koite maintained his cool demeanor, secretly contemplating his next move. Suddenly, his followers were stunned, their mouths agape, as they called out to their senior, Dae Sung. The Kaya student, previously thought to be formidable, turned out to be weaker than expected, much to their surprise. They marveled at Daesung's toughness as he endured the blows without uttering a sound. Each Kia member took turns punching him, reveling in their perceived victory. Throughout this, Ji Hyun remained silent, still affected by Ko Tae's words. Finally, she drew her sword to lend assistance. But who was really saving whom? It seemed like a foolish notion. Ji Hyun scornfully told Ko Tae to leave and return to where he came from. She then unleashed her formidable skills, confidently taking on each opponent alone. Despite everything, she believed no one could genuinely like her, especially not someone who intervened when she was vulnerable. Just as Ji Hyun stood her ground, Ko Tae suddenly reappeared, swiftly knocking the Kia student aside. At that moment, his speed surged to an unprecedented level, reaching an S rating according to the system's notification. The reason for this sudden burst remained unclear, leaving the Kia members bewildered and questioning whether they were experiencing lack. Meanwhile, Park Chan found himself bewildered by the Kia student's newfound speed, unable to comprehend how someone from Kia could achieve such velocity. As Ji Hyun observed the lightning-fast movements, she sensed something extraordinary. Even Ko Tae himself couldn't explain it, feeling an inexplicable surge of power coursing through his body. At the same time, while having dinner at home, Ko Tae's father spoke to his wife, indicating it was time to reveal the truth to their son. However, his wife hesitated, believing it might be best for him not to know anything. Nevertheless, Ko Tae's father still wanted to inform their son about the bloodline running through his veins. His wife asked how he intended to reveal it, suggesting whether it was about the Ko Tae bloodline, because Ko Tae was carrying the blood of the most powerful Yakuza in Japan, Yamazaki's, within him. If our son becomes a bloodthirsty demon, what should we do? So no matter what, they couldn't tell Ko Tae. The father could only nod in agreement. The bloodline Ko Tae was carrying was that of the ruler of all Japan. At this moment, Ko Tae intervened when someone aimed at Ji Hyun. Ko Tae couldn't counter-attack, but his blow, though not graceful, was strong enough to make the Kia person swell. He was furious that someone targeted Ji Hyun, 
unleashing his powerful and potentially awakening ancestral strength. At the same time, So Yun and Seom Haru were also fighting side by side. Seom Haru asked if it was the same over there, indicating that they were clearly a bunch of misfits but surprisingly persistent. They kept standing up although there was no threat whatsoever, making them a strange and annoying group. Moreover, they were weak before but now displayed an unclear burst of strength. Could it be because of Nam Kang Buk, that even facing death, they had to stand up? If so, how much stronger would the leaders be? This also meant that Kang Sok would be even stronger. Suddenly, Ju Hakchin appeared, wielding a crowbar and striking down everyone in his path. Then, he dropped his weapon in front of Kim so Yen and surrendered to her, although she didn't believe him. However, Kia explained that Nam Kang Buk have lost hope, so Ju Hakchin wanted to join forces with them to help defeat Kang Sok. He offered to be their informant within Tae Kang Buk, acting as their joker. He asked if they wanted to accept him. It was now So Lun's task to decide whether to accept Ju Hakchin or not, although the outcome of this decision was uncertain. The reward for accepting him was a gold card. Would you accept Ju Hakchin? So Yun was facing a difficult choice, even more so than saving her mother or her lover first. In the end, she called Hakchin and signaled for a temporary pause to let the group think. Hatchin was then pushed to the sidelines for so Yun's group to discuss. so Yun asked everyone's opinion on whether they should accept that dog Kia. Honestly, she didn't like him much, especially since he had attacked her dear Corte. Suddenly, Huan Su grabbed the mick and revealed something he had kept hidden. Hatchin had been beaten by Nam Kang Buk's leaders like a traitor. Despite Hatchin claiming he would betray Kang Sok, the loyalty of the other leaders caused their failure. They even had a strong bond, beating up Hak Chin in front of everyone and shamelessly taking all his people. Therefore, Huan Su argued that Kaya's betrayal was not out of the question. Thus, he supported Hak Chin's admission. So Yun, however, felt conflicted and suspicious. If this was also part of a plan, what then? If Kia pretended to attack the leader only to infiltrate their high school, it would all just be a ploy to catch them off guard. Heijun listened in shock, unable to utter a word. He tried to glance back at Soyeon, wondering if she had been outwitted by the gang leader. Despite the sudden revelation, Soyeon's composure remained, concluding that Kaya was a sly and despicable person, a typical troublemaker. Kwon Su closed his eyes, pondering over what so Yun had just said. It's not entirely impossible, he thought, realizing that such a scenario would only complicate matters further. so Yun's sharp intellect once again came into play as she unexpectedly proposed a brilliant idea, causing Kwon Su to widen his eyes in astonishment. Without hesitation, he called Hat Chin and extended his hand to welcome him into their group. Kwon Su remained vigilant, observing the situation closely to ensure everything would go smoothly. There's no harm, right? He thought disdainfully regarding the timid Hakchin. With the two parties now in agreement, Soyan solemnly addressed Hakchin. You'll be our wild card, our joker. A mischievous grin spread across Hakchin's face as he replied, That's exactly what I had in mind. With that, the mission of recruiting Hakchin was accomplished. Meanwhile, over at the Potato Team's location, the members of Dong Kang Buk lay defeated. Ji Yun and Ko Te fought side by side, swiftly eliminating their adversaries. Ko Te, showing concern, asked if their opponent was all right, reassuring them to just hang on a little longer. Ji Yun still believed that Nam Kang Buk would come to their aid because she had connections there, so Bun San couldn't abandon them. However, she was mistaken when she directly told Don Kang Buk that there would be no reinforcements. Bum Sang had received information that the leaders of Nam Kang Buk High School had regained control, so reinforcements were unlikely to arrive anytime soon. What was peculiar was that among the leaders, 
only Ji Xian was assigned to the front lines, indicating that Nam Kang Buck had already decided to abandon her. Just as he was barking out orders, he was silenced. Ku Wute, on the other hand, wasn't fond of beating around the bush. He directly unleashed a barrage of blows on Shustima, catching his opponent off guard with his intimidating remarks. Only Tao thought silently, she's really asking for it if she doesn't shut up. But despite her sharp words, her stats were still in the negative, returning her to her initial state, vulnerable to Shristima's counterattack. With superior stats, Shristima now had the upper hand over Kote, who was doubled over in pain, numb to the sensation. Shristima was eager to teach him a lesson, continuously delivering ruthless blows and taunting him to get up and dance. Meanwhile, Chihyuk was also struggling with the remaining two opponents. Kote, however, had risen to his feet, ready to unleash his technique, leaving his opponent puzzled. What kind of finger technique is that? Are you planning to spin your finger? Kote was anxious to turn the tables, hoping to provoke his opponent into submission to save his beloved. As he contemplated his strategy, Kia couldn't wait any longer and grabbed his arm, then delivered a devastating blow with his knee to Kote's nose, breaking it. Caught off guard, Kote clutched his injured arm, trembling with pain. Kia smirked, mocking him for his apparent weakness, questioning why Kote, who defeated Yang Chiam Ha from Bak Kang Buk with Kim Tui Jie, was still suffering. Sensing that Kaya had broken his arm, Kote could barely contain his pain. Park Chen, unable to witness but eager to see Kote's reaction, was about to open his wallet when Ji Yun suddenly intervened with a sword. It was a surprise move that caught everyone off guard. Kote looked on in astonishment as Ji Hyun stood her ground, their gaze fixed on Park Jim, ready to settle the score. However, what unfolded before Kote's eyes was a sight he dreaded. The girl he cared for was being held by Kia, taking punches from another assailant before being hit again with a vicious blow. Others joined in the assault, leaving her in a vulnerable state. At this moment, Kote recalled how his father always pushed him to excel, which made him suspicious when his father asked if he had someone he liked. He straightforwardly admitted that he did, that he had an issue. He always stopped at the stage of unrequited love. His father then advised him that throughout history, males were always obligated to protect females, even though it wasn't a duty. As a man, he should know how to protect the woman he loves. Feeling helpless as he lay there, watching his beloved endure pain, Kote blamed himself for being weaker than others and wondered how he could protect her. The Kia gang had disarmed Ji Hyun and intended to finish her off. Ji Hyun, sweating profusely, resigned herself to her fate as Kia raised his sword to strike her down. Reflecting on a past conversation between Kia and his father, Kote was astonished when Kaya's father admitted he was weaker than his wife. 